There was a place in Ocala, Florida called Spaceballs. Which was a pool hall, but also a place that we hung out at a lot. The owner thought of us sort of as a type of security. And one night there was someone that showed up that he really did not like, and he wanted us to make the guy leave. I used to wear these rings thinking that if I punched somebody, it was going to cause more pain, and it did. Every time I hit this guy in the face, he would scream. And we had me hitting him, he had this guy Mike hitting him. And one guy broke his hand punching him so hard. Some punched her harder and harder and harder, and eventually got loose. One shoe came off, I remember Joe took and just whizzed it across the parking lot. And as soon as we got him out on the ground, I walked over and was like, all right, and threw the guy a kick. It was basically kind of soft at first. And I remember the guy cried out, mama, mama. I had a thought for one second when I was giving really brief kicks that uh, if you let this bother you now, it'll bother you for the rest of your life. So I made like a switch, learning how to turn my conscience off. And at that point, just kicked the ever-loving shit out of that guy. And uh, <laughs> walked off and left him. He wasn't black or Hispanic, not a person of color at all. Uh, he was just a stupid white guy doing stupid stuff that was in the wrong place at the right time. In recent years, We've become accustomed to hearing how the Jewish Agency for Israel has rescued Jews from areas of distress like Yugoslavia, Chechnya, Abkhazia, and brought them to safety here in Israel. But when we hear that the Jewish Agency has rescued a young American Jew from Daytona Beach, Florida, that's another story altogether. It's the story of John Daly. Welcome, John. Your story begins back in 1990 on a beach in Florida. What happened? A group of uh, seven neo-Nazi skinheads some of whom were from the town of Ocala that I lived in, recognized me and uh, proceeded to do their best to do me in. And they tried to kill you? Yes, sir. Hate crime, in general, there's no statute of limitations on hate crime. So therefore, I, I'm going to have to refrain from it. Okay. I mean, if there's certain things I say, I could literally wind up in prison. One of them shouted out, die, Jew boy, die. Um, and they pulled me into the ocean and uh, two of them sat on me to make sure that uh, I couldn't get up. The perpetrators of this crime are members of a known national organization who would not stop at murdering John, uh, in part, I think, to save themselves from, from prosecution somewhere down the line. Because those kind of people, when you come to hate crimes, they don't forget. I mean, like, they don't forget. And when you do it, you don't want them to forget. You know, you want them to know what you're doing is wrong. It's against them, it's hatred. Hey, I'm right here, don't forget me. We're never gonna let you live in peace. Luckily, you survived, amazingly yes, survived. Yes, sir. It's really hard to believe almost that this kind of anti-Semitism, skinhead attacks, exists in the United States. Is this an isolated incident or do you know of others like it? No, I don't believe it's an isolated incident. I think that, uh... Where their attacks may not be against uh, necessarily Jew Jews in general, but they're against minorities. And I think any attack on any minority is, a, is an attack on us. But six years after they were sent to jail, if I remember correctly, two of the people who attacked you were released. Did things change for you then? They were beginning to. Um, some of the people went to jail for uh, just assault and battery. Two went to jail for attempted murder. Um, they were leaders in the, the racist organizations. And they had made it clear that when they got out that uh, they were going to finish the job. I always thought I had the greatest criminal mind of anyone I'd ever met. And John loved to entertain these ideas because I always had some good ones. We just, you know, basically somehow stayed out of trouble while causing a lot of trouble. One of our favorite things to do was go shooting. Uh, we both had matching 38 five shots and uh, we put them to work. The Skinheads are an organization such that uh... Say members from Orlando will sit around and laugh and joke around at the beginning of the evening, telling stories about the houses they firebombed or the former members that they shot before they begin any discussions. That way the, the groundwork has been laid for you to understand what happens to people that just walk away. What drew me to John was he was very quiet, 
very well thought. You could tell he was an incredibly methodical person. He was like a chess player. He was like Bobby Fischer. He was always 10 moves ahead. Uh, he knew what he wanted from life, it seemed. He wanted the same things I wanted. Power. I was almost like his antithesis because I was very quick to react and very loud and John was exactly the opposite, very calm, cool and collective. As where he would get mad, he would almost whisper and get very quiet and smile a lot. As where I would get loud and in your face and move around a bunch. So it was, uh, it was an odd dichotomy with the two of us together. At the hospital, as we pressed John for more information, he said it was his friends, so-called friends, who had beat him up. And that's when the story began to come out. He was very selfish. Can still be. The tumor has been the best thing that ever happened to him. It's made him humble. And I used to pray, God, he needs to be broken. John's father came from a very violent background. He brought that into the marriage. Guns, knives, you name it, I've had it held to my head, to my throat. My dad, when he was younger, was a gang leader in New York City. No small thing un un unto itself. My dad would hit Puerto Ricans to see which way they would fall. That was something I remember hearing more than once from various members of my family as I grew up. When he was younger, he ran over my grandfather and shot my uncle, both in the same night. It was about feeling safe and not feeling alone and feeling you're part of something. Even if it wasn't something you wanted to be a part of, once you were in, you know, once I was tattooed and, and it, you know, recruited, I was top of the pecking order. Uh, as soon as you bring, you know, five or six people to the table, all of a sudden everybody loves you. One thing that separated me from a lot of the other guys and something that got me noticed was the fact that I had no tattoos. The only tats I wanted were ones that uh, no one would give me. I wanted skins on the inside of my lip. The other tat that I wanted was a spider web showing that I'd killed somebody. And that, of course, I had yet to earn. I remember one day there was, um, I was at somebody's house, one of the apartments in the area, and uh, a group of black guys showed up and they said they wanted one of the guys inside, a white guy, a friend of mine. And uh, I don't know how many it was, but they just came into the door and uh, jumped on him, started beating on him. Got him back into the kitchen, and uh, there was a frying pan on the kitchen stove, a nice big lead frying pan. And they made an interesting whack when they hit him in the head. They hit him so hard, they dented this uh, metal frying pan on top of his head. Um, and just the fear and the helplessness at that moment that I had no one I could call, no one to turn to. There's no one that I could say, hey, I need help that could come. And uh, that was a terrifying moment. Because of the bullying he'd had from black people, he got so he didn't like them, and it put a fear in him. And all of a sudden, he finds these people to be a part of that's got his back. He was tired of being picked on, and I can't say as I blame him. Marion County Against, Against Racism was basically a group of skinheads. Weren't racist, they weren't active and doing much more than just seeking where the next beer was gonna come from and uh, looking out for one another. And that was something that was new to me and uh, I was instantly drawn to it. I saw their style of dress, I saw their camaraderie, the fact that they flowed together, laughed together, and more importantly, they all had, they all had each other's back. You know, coming from being a, a geeky kid who was picked on, you know, who never felt to belong to all of a sudden have people that would do your bidding is, it feels good, I'm not gonna lie, it feels good. Uh, one of the guys lifted up his shirt, showed me a white hand and a black hand breaking a swastika. And he said, oh, it's cool that you're Jewish. You know, we don't have a problem with uh, racists whatsoever. There were some guys from MCAR that did have racist white supremacist tattoos that I didn't know about. They were hidden on their bodies that I didn't see until much, much later. Two of the guys went down to Orlando. And while they were down there, they met up with some racist skinheads from AYF, Aryan Youth Force. AOF was led by a guy named Richie, who was a diehard neo-Nazi skinhead. One day there was a knock at my front door, and he was outside with two other neo-Nazi skinheads. So in the back of my mind, I was like, all right, if this is for you, like if they're here for you, go with them. I didn't know that the guys that he'd met up with had already handed over the names and addresses of everybody where we all lived. And um, he didn't know I was Jewish. 
That was one piece of information that Chris and Ian kept to themselves. So as I rode with them, and they're telling me about this organization that uh, they belong to. About, oh yeah, you remember that guy, Bobby? Bobby moved to a different city. They found him crucified in his front yard. And each one told a story about somebody who was mysteriously this, mysteriously this, mysteriously that. And then Richie leaned over the back and said, oh, welcome aboard. And I knew at that moment that I wasn't being asked. I was being told, one, you're not with us. And two, if you try and leave, it wasn't that they did this to strangers that refused them, they did this to their friends. So at that moment, I wasn't gonna say, wait a second, I'm Jewish, I can't be involved. Little did I know I was meeting with uh, my future attempted murder that day. He's trying to hide the fact that he's a Jew, getting more and more involved in serious, racist, skinhead meetings. There was no internet, there was no com computers, you didn't have cell phones. These guys, are totally enmeshed in society. I knew they could find me because you just didn't know if you'd look, the guy sitting next to you in a restaurant was a supporter, was active. And when you see that at 16 years old, that you're near a police cruiser and a police officer in uniform is talking to you as an equal because you're a racist and thinking, wow, I can't call the cops. What if they send this guy? There were parties you hear people bragging about hanging out with judges. You hear people talking about hanging out with politicians. I couldn't type into Google in 1990, hey, how do I get out of a neo-Nazi organization? Can you help me? I couldn't turn to my parents and say, hey, I know you guys don't have money. Let's move to another city, change our names, and try and go into the witness protection program. <laughs> no, it doesn't work like that. And I would say, where are you going, John? I'm going out. Well, how did you hurt your fist? It looks bruised. I don't know, I just knocked it against something. And suddenly, the door was shut. I wasn't a part of John's life anymore. I really stopped dealing with my parents and my brothers and other people around me, even some very close friends. They walked down the hall in their Doc Martin boots or combat boots, and the kids and the teachers stepped back and made way for them. And by association, whether you're tough or not, all of a sudden you are. And you scare the shit out of people which is very attractive to somebody that months prior <laughs> was picked on. And all of a sudden, you're placed in the position where, hey, I can defend myself now. I don't have to be afraid anymore. On one hand, I'm terrified that they're gonna find out I'm Jewish, but on the other, I think it's so far away, the chance is so far, rem so remote, so removed from me, that uh, I'm safe now. I've actually found safety in the embrace of Nazism as a Jew. So uh, if I'm stuck and there's nothing I can do, I might as well try and be uh, as tough and as crazy and as wild as the rest of the people around me. The American Front was a national organization with chapters all over the United States. It was started by David Lynch, who was the Eastern States Chairman of the American Front, who ostensibly had 5,000 soldiers under his command. And Bob Hike. Bob Hike was somebody that was on the Geraldo Rivera show. Sick and tired of hearing the sob stories from kikes. I get sick and tired of seeing Uncle Tom here I sucking know, up, trying to be a kike. Hey, hold it. Hey, hold it. Hey, hold it. Hey, hold it. Sit down. He's a member of a group where most of them haven't even finished high school. And he's had his nose in books since he was a kid. He knows the history of World War I, World War II, the weapons, everything about it, both sides, the German side and the other side, Allied side. So when he was involved with these people, he would keep them straight. They'd try to tell him a story and he'd say, it didn't happen that way, it happened this way. And he could produce the facts and the book and the page and show you where it happened. So these people, the leaders begin to see, hey, we got a kid that can think on his feet. He's not just out there boozing and fighting and, 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 and creating a ruckus. He can think. He knows how to think on his feet. And they begin to take an interest in him. This was a leader that they wanted to train. Bob Height called me a good little racist. One day when I asked about if, they, if he'd said anything about me, and that's how, what was relayed back to me. Bob said, you're a good little racist. And I remember at the time being so touched. So for Bob, this was something, I was somebody that he knew. David Lynch as well, I was somebody he'd spoken to. 
In the summer of 1990, I received a phone call saying, I want you to know you're the Northern Florida leader of the American Front. All of North Florida belongs to you. I now had, in my mind, unlimited power. I knew that I could pick up a phone, make a call, and say, I want something done. And there were guys that would do it. It wasn't something that I was going to say, oh, no, thank you. And truthfully, I was honored and flattered that I had been recognized. We talked a little bit about it, and I remember telling John, John, you've been to Yad Vashem. You've seen what the Nazis did. They killed Jews. And he just sort of like shrugged his shoulders, like, oh, well. I distinctly remember my mom sitting me down one night and uh, her saying, John, they're going to hurt you. I knew what she meant. When they found out you're Jewish, they're going to they're gonna hurt you. I didn't find out John was Jewish, I think, until I tried to put him in the ground. Uh, it was how I found out. The evening of October the 6th, 1990, the phone kept ringing off the hook. And it was Heather, the ex-wife of one of John's best friends. And with great urgency, she kept saying, he must be at Daytona Beach. We're having a special meeting tonight. He's got to be there. And um, that's when uh, I found out that they knew, yeah. Everybody was involved. None of these guys were going out of the way to be like, hey, maybe you should get out of here. Every time I went into a room, it would get quiet. I'm like, man, this is weird. This is just the weirdest vibe I've ever gotten. Um, at one point, someone said, let's go down to the beach. One guy punched me behind my ear. I heard somebody shout, now! And then the rest came in, and the punches just started flying. And I'm shouting out, you know, I'm a skinhead. You know, I was trying to think, my mind was trying to rationalize why this was happening. And somebody shouted out, die, Jew boy, die. And at that point, I knew there's no coming back. It wasn't just one or two kicks, all right, we're done. I mean, it was a, a, an ongoing, continuous, savage beating. They were going to kill him. And they beat him up and dragged him out in the ocean, drowned him, and left him floating out to sea. And uh, when I couldn't hold my breath any longer and I inhaled, I could feel the water hit my lungs, and as soon as it hit my lungs, I shot it out, and then my lungs went, <gasps> and I filled up again. I read the depositions, every one of them. They went back into the ocean, sat on him, pushed him down to the bottom of the beach where he could feel the abrasion of the sand on his face and held him down until he died. You feel the water rush into your lungs, and just as quickly, your lungs will collapse to shoot it out. And then again, it'll expand again, and it takes two pulls of your diaphragm to completely fill your lungs with water. And you can feel it. Oh, you can feel it. Especially on an October night, <laughs> you can feel when that cold water hits your lungs. And that's when I felt myself die. The darkness just began to close in, covering up the light, and then it sealed it out. And that was it. I ceased to be. And according to their statements in court, the water was a foot over his face, his mouth was open, and his arms were out to his side, and he was floating out to sea. And I believe God washed that kid back up on that beach and saved my son's life. And apparently the doctors told my parents, get ready to say goodbye to your son. He's most likely not gonna survive. And I remember I had an Indian doctor that came in and looked at me and said, uh, there's no medical reason why you're, you should be alive. You need to find something to believe in. A table, a chair, you need to find something to pray to because there is something that saved your life. So at first I, I didn't believe it. And then when I, I knew it was true, I was more concerned about his well-being. It was a hard time in our little town, I'm not gonna lie. Everybody, it seemed like everybody was out to get everybody else. Everybody was throwing everybody else under the bus. So, it, like I said, as soon as I graduated high school, which was quickly, I got a regular old high school diploma, and I was like a prom dress. I was off. Uh, ended up moving to Gainesville for a bit, still in the movement, and then wound up in Apopka, Florida, uh, hanging out with the same group of guys, uh, eventually, that tried to cause John's demise, uh, at which time I realized probably in a little bit over my head.
The last threat I received was a very simple, when the last guy gets out of prison, we're gonna have a reunion. All of us together with you, and we're gonna finish what was started. I contacted the Jewish agency, and I said, I need to move to Israel now. They were a Jewish family in trouble. This was a Jewish kid in trouble. And we were not asking a lot of questions. We just wanted to know how we could help. And they began to get the, the wheels moving. And I found myself in short order in my new home in the state of Israel, where here I felt safe. Mom! I'm coming, I'm coming. I've had two awake brain surgeries, and that's exactly what it sounds like. You are awake while you're going through surgery. And the operating table is such that I was strapped down, my legs and my arms were out to the side. I could feel them pulling my scalp as they uh, detached it from my skull. For some reason, the anesthetic that they used to uh, numb my cranium, my skull, so I wouldn't feel it, didn't work. So once that saw started sliding in, it was a pain that I cannot even begin to describe. The neuropsychologist I was dealing with explained to me that this was most likely the product of a slow bleed in my brain. She looked at me and said, you've had this tumor for a long time. The only thing I can think of that would cause a slow bleed in my brain would have been the beating of Daytona. The thing I'm looking forward to the most when I go to Prague is to spend time with somebody who was a friend of mine 20 years ago under entirely different circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, really to show the power of change. That yes. no matter who you are or who you were, you can always become somebody else. Um, that only you stick yourself in a pattern of self-identification. I'm a loser, I'm a failure. Um, that he opted, he made the decision to get out of uh, the skinhead racist lifestyle. So, um... Was it because of what happened to you? I believe part of it was because of what happened to me. He and I were very, very close at the time. But I think it's also, uh, from what I understand, that um, I went underground, no one could find me. And, uh, there was definitely revenge taken on the friends of John the Jew. And uh, he apparently was one of them that uh, was attacked and beaten up several times because he was loyal and had been my friend and didn't, um, uh, um, didn't betray me. And I just disappeared. And there were a lot of friends, him included, that were very offended at the fact that I didn't believe their friendship could span uh, the boundaries. But uh, as far as I was concerned, no one was to be trusted, and no one was. <laughs> and to this day, no one is. It's just the way it is. Kevin was one of my best friends at a period in my life when my life was smoke and mirrors. The last time I remember sitting and standing and talking with Kevin face to face, both of us had guns in our hands. And it's a lot to digest leaving Israel, cutting the umbilical cord to my hospitals. I'm excited to see him. I'm excited to see who he's become, uh, where he's gone in his life, which I'm quite impressed with. Um, but at the same time, what if he's still with the white power movement? Josh's going to be in Prague for a week, so that gives me girl time with my twin sister. And we can talk up late and cook popcorn and do all kinds of noisy things. And besides, she likes cooking on our stove, so I know we're going to get southern fried chicken. I provide the stove and the gas, she cooks, and I eat. It's a great combination. It's a winner all the way around. All right, Mom, I'm out of here. John, do you want to take some cookies with you to eat along the way? Nothing. Sure. Yeah, just give me a hug. God bless. Bye, Rosie. Wherever you are.
first things first. I need to call home and let him know that I'm alive, that I made it. It's not letting me call out, not letting me call anybody. But I've got it set up for, uh, for Wi-Fi. For some reason, it's not doing it. When you trust it, this is the real deal. This isn't uh, anything else. I'm already looking out to see if anybody's looking at me harder than they should. Um, harder than I feel they should. Am I going to meet somebody with long sleeves, hiding tattoos, a weird haircut? Or am I going to meet uh, just a normal uh, citizen? It was a long road coming out of the skinhead movement. I'm not going to lie. It was a long road to where coming back to what I thought was like everybody else, because I never felt normal, I never felt welcome, I never felt like I was one of the gang or I was like other people. I always felt that there was something different about me or I wasn't right. John and I were quite close uh, right up until the attack. Uh, I was actually getting more involved with the skinheads uh, locally. And then after that happened, those same skinheads that I just started hanging out with uh, branded me a Jew lover. Uh, so as soon as I graduated high school, I was gone from Ocala because I was really afraid of what they might do to me, thinking I might be the next guy, you know, to get a boot party or maybe stabbed in a parking lot somewhere, just for being associated with John. What are you hoping for? <laughs> What's up, man? How are you? Same. All right, let me see this guy. Where's this guy? My name's Kevin Connell, and I'm a sommelier. Uh, my brother was hated, was a known racist uh, to blacks, um, but they were scared of him because he was a pretty big, violent guy. Because they couldn't or wouldn't do anything to my brother, I was a prime target. I guess I was 14. My brother had graduated high school. I uh, was attacked by no more than six, no less than four uh, black youths. Um, they crushed my orbital socket, my nose, broke my jaw. Uh, I had a cerebral hematoma um, of the right frontal lobe. Uh, they had to drill a hole, put a catheter in my skull. So things were pretty rough. I was in the hospital for, for several months. Um, after that, I was enrolled in a special school for problem children, though I had done nothing wrong. Um, but while I was in the hospital, uh, the local skinheads had found out what happened and they were the only people to come visit me. But they were the people that showed me that I didn't have to be scared anymore and then I got involved in the movement. Joseph Goebbels, I read his biography, you know, it also has his journal that he kept. And he talks about when he was a child, you know, being ostracized, being lonely. And his story really hit home with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I read Mein Kampf and, you know, I was never a big guy, but I was always a smart guy. So I learned if I was smarter than everybody else, they would protect me. You know, I grew up in a, a, in a household where we moved almost every year. My father worked for Alcott Tobacco and Firearms. Uh, so I lived all over the country. By the time I was 13, we'd lived in 11 cities. So I never really had any close friends my whole life. So it was nice to have people that I didn't care about that cared about me. And then my parents moved to Ocala because of my involvement with the skinheads. Second day at school, I met you. And it just kind of kept snowballing from there. <laughs> and then John, John's attack happened pretty quickly after that, I'd say, you know, less than nine months after that. It was the day or the day before, and I did know that he was going to meet with the guys, and he thought he was getting a promotion and was moving up even further the ladder. And he was quite excited. Uh, and when I learned about it, I didn't believe it at first, because I'm like, John's not Jewish, I've been to his house. Met his parents, they're not Jewish. Uh, they, there's a cross or something somewhere there, I remember thinking. I'm like, they can't be Jewish. I think they're wrong. And then as it unfolded, and uh, John pretty much disappeared for a while. Uh, as it unfolded and it made the newspapers and whatnot, there was, a, no, there was no denying it that John was definitely Jewish. Uh, and John had been pulling the wool over a lot of people's eyes and doing a fantastic job and feeding him lines of shit, and they were just eating it up. Uh, 
because he was good at being thoughtful and maniacal all at the same time. And I still don't even understand how everyone else found out because he was so good about not letting people know because uh, he always had an answer for everything. <laughs> so I find it hard to believe that somebody saw through the facade or, or somebody figured it out on, on their own. I, to this day, I'd, I'd like to ask him exactly, you know. I know that it was a mutual skinhead that we knew, uh, wife and mother of his child at the time, that uh, threw him under the bus, per se. Uh, but I don't know how she found out. Keep taking left, you'll find the bathroom. Keep taking left. I found it. <laughs> Let's cut the streets, see what kind of trouble we can not get into. Hopefully. Hopefully. How did you get in there? So it's closed? I've been trying to find John on Facebook for quite some time. I literally had to find everybody else from Ocala and make friends with him until I found somebody who was friends with John. Risotto Aborio with carrot, zucchini, shallots, and Parmesan. Yeah, let's do it. You like it? Yeah, I'm down. Okay. Nice and eclectic. Looks like they have decent beers. The easiest way to recruit people into the, into the skinhead movement and the white supremacist movement is people that are just outside, that are right on the fringe that are trying to put their foot into a clique, or they're trying to belong, they're trying to make friends, they're slightly geeky, slightly not everybody, not like everyone else. Because um, when you show people a little bit of power and you show people loyalty, you'd be surprised what they'll do for you. And what they do is they go through and they take all of your failures in your life and say, no, 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 it wasn't a failure, it's a conspiracy. And they build this conspiracy slowly but surely and strong enough that you really buy into it. And then you're like, I am at war. And these people that are trying to do this to me, my culture, my family, my race, need to be destroyed. And you really feel like you're doing something for the betterment of society, your race, because all they want to do is destroy your race and bring your race down. Um, and once you've got somebody like that, you've got, uh, you've got a holy warrior, you've got a terrorist. So it all starts at the top. And I was at the very bottom but by recruiting, you're moving up. And then all those people are at the bottom. As they recruit, they move up. So it's a mentality, an ideology, and a movement that perpetuates itself. Preying upon the weak, the downtrodden. Nobody easier to get in the movement than somebody that's been bullied. Because you have all these people that you think are like-minded uh, that will defend you. And that's one thing that, that I will say, that skinheads are quick to violence and quick to defend their own. Not too far from here in Prague, there was a, uh, you know, basically a trans and internment camp where the Czech Republic funneled, you know, several hundred thousand of their Jews through and sent them off to even further Eastern Europe to be... Eradicated. I just wanted to go and pay my respects um, to all those who lost their lives at the hands of the Third Reich. And I wouldn't want to do it with anybody other than John, honestly. You know, horrible atrocities that, that affected millions and millions of people. And this is the ideology that I, that I you know, lived by mm -hmm. for four years of my life. His journey, in a sense, is harder than mine. Being Jewish, I had something to turn to. He didn't. He left something that was like a family-type relationship and moved back into the, the real world. Living in Israel, he finally feels at home and he feels like he's with his people. And uh, leaving with this, I know that that's something I'd like to feel in life. You know, I'd like to feel that I do belong to something and that I have something to look forward to and I have something to believe in. I'm not sure what it's going to be. Uh, I used to consider myself to be a, a real American patriot, um, but I don't like the direction that my country is going a whole lot. And I will wear my yarmulke, my kippah, as we call it in Hebrew. Kippah? Kippah. Yamaka is Yiddish, Kipa is Hebrew. A little earlier, as we pulled in, kind of came overwhelmed with emotion. Mm -hmm. Started shaking a bit, and as I went into the laboratory a few moments ago, I, I did get sick. Wow.
Going to the camp, it makes it, it's like putting a, a face with a name. Uh, it's no longer, you know, old reels that you see on TV programs and documentaries, you know, written by some guy who wasn't there. It's not a page from a history book, it's real. The Kuala Lama is doing what you can to fix the world to the best of your ability. And if that just starts with you and the way that you live your life and who you are, um, which what you're doing now is uh, the Kuala Lama. You're going back and fixing some of the wrongs. Trying to. You can't at one point stop it and say, that's enough. Uh, things need to be different. And they do. More than 1,500 Jews were imprisoned in a small fortress. Their destiny was worst of all the groups of prisoners. About 500 from them were tortured to death here. Most others perished after the deportation to the concentration camps. 1,500 people of the Jewish faith died there. I find that hard to believe. Um, the Nazis were really avid and, and, and real go-getters. This was a transit camp as well, where people yeah. were coming, merely coming in to wait for the train to go Take off to the east. Off. The Dachau, Sobibor, Auschwitz, Birkenau. This was just merely a stop on their voyage. What you wrote in the, um, the book, um, the guest book, what did you write? I'm sorry. I wanted to come to room 18. Because 18 in Judaism means life, in the word Chai. It's just playing with the, uh, the way that we count the numbers. Uh, the letters of the alphabet. Exactly. Um, so I wanted to see what room 18 was. It says, the mortuary where the bodies of prisoners tortured to death were stored. Starting at the end of 42, dead bodies were cremated in Terence's crematorium, crematorium of the Jewish ghetto. Um, but for skinheads, this also has a... Yeah, they've kind of stolen it and made it their own. Yeah. They black One, letters first letter a... is A. For Adolf. The second letter, H, H for Hitler, is the H letter. H is the eighth letter. Of the alphabet. Can I do it with a black, with a red circle around it? You know, Hitler. I mean, I'm still I'm not going to lie. Uh, I'm still afraid of a large group of black people, um, and I know that's still a little bit crazy. But I'm still very hypervigilant as well. There's just certain things that I don't feel that I can turn my back on because, I mean. If it's happened more than a couple times, you know, you should learn from your mistakes. I'll admit that I do have certain uh, animosity within me. Um, but when I would uh, be asked if I've forgiven the, the skinhead guys who tried to take my life, um, I would always say it's the best thing that happened to me because it gave me life. It taught me to value life and the sanctity of life. We walked through a 500 meter long tunnel. There were several spots as we walked through where the temperature seemed to drop and get very, very cold. It was almost like there was electricity in the air. All the hair on my body would stand up. And just to take it in to know that there's almost everyone that walked through that tunnel didn't walk back. It was a lot to take in. You all right, Kevin? Yeah. I don't even know what's happening inside. If you were going to die, and you knew it, um, there's something known as the Martyr's Prayer. Okay. Um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And that is something that uh, I'm sure this hallway's heard more than once. torture just to be led down this, not knowing what was gonna happen. Your brain tries to rationalize how what's happening isn't happening. Right. That somehow I'm going to live, somehow I'm going to survive. And from fights you've been in and attacks you've gone through, I'm sure your brain's done the exact yeah, same that thing. Yeah, that will, that want. Yeah. Where you close off the outside world and you turn in. Yeah. I do know it. This isn't happening to me. Yeah, um, this isn't real. I'm gonna live through this. I'm gonna wake up and I'm gonna be fine that your brain is so arrogant, the one thing that it can't say is, I'm not gonna survive this. No. And the moment of peace that hit me when uh, I was attacked by the skins <sighs> was just uh, when I came to the ultimate understanding conclusion that I wasn't gonna make it out of it. And then it was just like my brain just relaxed. Really, you know how it is. Yeah, I mean. A situation like that, you just wanna go home. Right, you just want your bed, your mom. Yeah, when you go, you wanna go to where you feel safe. And at that moment, I did not feel safe. 
And I knew enough cops that were involved in the white power movement that they're not uh, your that they're not the best people to go to in that kind of situation. No. I mean that whole part of Central Florida, as we know, most of the sheriff's department were in the Ku Klux Klan and probably still are. I wouldn't doubt it. At one point, uh, after I was out of the skinheads uh, for quite a while. I, uh, I was arrested and thrown in jail for what Kevin does best, being a smart ass and drunk, uh, and not listening to authority. I've always had a problem with authority. And I wound up in jail for not a long time, but enough time. Uh, and I still had not covered up all of my tattoos. And one of the tattoos I had was quite vulgar and quite hateful. Uh, and they're symbols that anybody in the white supremacist world knows and instantly sees and instantly knows what it means. Uh, and it was not anything I still believed in, of course, uh, but it was still tattooed on me. And, you know, you, I couldn't make it go away. Uh, and I wound up in a cell block with uh, someone from the Aryan Brotherhood who had just violated parole and was about to be before the judge to be resentenced to go back to prison, most likely. And I've never been more afraid for myself because I knew that I was gonna tell the truth and that I was gonna say my piece and let him know that that's not who I am any longer and I don't agree with you. Um, it was honestly probably the scariest 48 hours until, that, until I was moved and became a trustee and was moved to a different cell block uh, since I was a skinhead. Uh, I'd never been, I hadn't been that scared in 15 years. Uh, it brought it home to know that I didn't cover up the tattoos because I wanted to remember, you know, how stupid I was. Uh, and I wore them so that I didn't forget. Not about anybody else, but so I didn't forget. But after that experience, I felt it was time to not hurt anybody else with the images that I had on my body. And it wasn't even about me, it was about other people and about sending a message that I didn't believe in. Uh, so it can be very hard to walk away from your past. And that, uh, that really hit home. And that was when I truly started thinking about the future, which was something I had really never thought about. I kept living in the past and that was like one of the, the clarifying moments knowing that Moving forward, I still have to have a life. Oh my God. When we went all the way through the tunnel and rounded the corner and headed down the little hill and I saw three crosses and there was a tour group and the woman was speaking in English, made mention that this is where the soldiers lied when this was still just a military installation and used this embankment for target practice. But after the Third Reich had taken over and occupied uh, and was using the camp uh, as a transit camp and a death camp, that that's where these people had walked and been executed or walked and be hung. Uh, it was emptying. I don't know how else to describe it. it. It took what little bit of okay feeling I had inside of me and stripped it out and let me know that it's real. None of those people came back. And this is where they met their end. It was very real, very real. For those who weren't tortured, of course, were executed here. Mm -hmm. I wish you'd like the candle here as well. Get a candle, you want me to get a candle? I mean, every person that wound up there wasn't there for anything they did besides for being themselves being people of the earth, living their lives. It's a heavy burden to carry, you know, knowing that I, I preach the same nonsense to a lot of people. It convinced a lot of people that it was right. I should feel ashamed. I can only try to do right from this point on. Well, this is uh, a huge, huge step. There were a few places that John and I had stopped and John brought some, some stones that I'd asked him to bring me. 
uh, from Jerusalem because I, I thought Jerusalem being the holy city um, and the holiest place to the Jewish faith, and none of these people made it there. You know, it was right around the corner. May their memories be for a blessing. May it always be remembered. And I walked through all of the gravestones and I found only one gravestone that didn't have a rock on it. I made sure I put a rock there so everybody knows that they're not alone and they are remembered. And the thing that really hit me is about a third of them were just numbers. They didn't have names. So it's, they were just bodies in the ground. And it makes you think about their entire communities and entire families and entire villages that were completely wiped out and there's nobody to remember and nobody to tell anybody that it happened. May that little light serve as a reminder of uh, all the lights that were snuffed out at this horrible place and the other horrible camps around Europe. Another stone from Jerusalem. One I brought from home. It's been quite the day, John. It has. Once you realize that hatred is just fear of the unknown and fear of yourself, uh, it doesn't take long to want to see the truth and want to see humanity for what it's worth. Along this voyage, I've also come to the conclusion that there are more bad people than there are good people in the world. And I was one of them. Uh, I can't, I can't undo what I've done. I can't undo what I've said, but I can try to stop it. And I can do my best to try to educate people to, to the truth that ignorance and fear breed hatred. And we don't have to be afraid. I noticed that Kevin kept some of his, uh, the stones that he had. And I asked him, as we discussed it, what to do with those stones, he said that uh, if you ever visit a place like this again, he wanted to have some. I was thinking to go to Auschwitz Birkenau. Why exactly uh, Auschwitz, of all places? Over a million people died there no, that they know of. One million, one hundred thousand. Yeah, that they know of. They know of. Uh, would you be willing to be awake at uh, quarter to five in the morning tomorrow? Four. Four. Um, You said, of all the places you could visit, you would like to go to Auschwitz for a canal. My body doesn't want me to go. <sighs> I'm serious. I had to take a moment in the parking lot just to sit um, and try and catch my breath from breaking down, realizing where I was. Going into brain surgery was easier than this. As soon as we crossed through the entryway to Auschwitz, Kevin fell on my shoulder, crying. And I kept repeating, I'm sorry, I'm so, so sorry. But just the thought that I'd raised my arm and that accursed symbol of the Zeke Heil. As we were walking through Auschwitz, and we came to the destroyed gas chambers, and it was quite literally the end of the line, that was where the railroad tracks stopped. But coming to the end of that line was part of a spiritual journey that I've been on for over 20 years and that Kevin's been on for over 20 years. It's part of our national anthem, singing about uh, Jerusalem, our dream of 2,000 years.
If we go down here and walk down, there's one building uh, standing. It's the last building remaining from those sent from terrorism, which is where we were yesterday. Everything you see up and down this row on both sides were people that were sent here from there. And so when you said yesterday that you felt like the numbers were off, they came here. I would say you were right. bothers me is this place just goes on for forever and ever. You're entering a courtyard with the SS murdered thousands of people. Please maintain silence here. Remember their suffering and show respect for their memory. wonder if, uh, if God chose wisely with me. Why did I, a punk little 17-year-old kid, deserve an extra chance? I want to go to the gas chambers. It's been probably one of the most life-changing events in my life. I'm not gonna lie. It's gonna take a long time to take all this in. I feel a little cleaner inside. But then again, I have all this emotion, all this hate, but I don't want it to be hate because I don't have anybody to hate. I have all this anger. I have no place to project it. I've never in my life had to process something, and I've always, it's always. Hey, okay, let's move on. Next thing. This is something that's bigger than me, beyond me. It's going to take me a long time to understand. Mm -hmm. I think more people should come. Thank you. Without you, this wouldn't have happened. And I think about going through the trial and how friends, so-called friends, because y'all were tight, you believed the same thing and you had each other's back. Like brothers. All of you were brainwashed, but they were brainwashed where they were ready to kill a brother because he was a Jew. I don't know whether education would make a difference, but both, most of them would drop out from school. They weren't interested in education. And the end result was you dying and winding up at your own end of the line. And it was an end of the line for you. But it was the end of the line for us too. Your mom and dad and your brothers and what we went through. Our lives were turned upside down. God, I don't want to go.
go through that ever again. I can't think of anything worse than a family to have to go through something like that. Have I ever apologized to you? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> John's story is a story of hope, a story of victory, the whole story of his life. This is just one little segment of his life. The whole story of John's life is amazing and I, I think people need to know what a great man and how many great things he's done from where he came and to where he is. And whatever I can do to help him, I would do. The families I've met that are either going through, that have a child like I was, not necessarily a Jewish family, but say like, a, like Kevin, we have a child that's involved in a racist organization, what do I do? The answer is always love them. Make them feel like they have a place to come back to. Many times over the years, people have asked me, why do you think you survived? And I definitely know that I survived because God decided it wasn't my time to go. And I've tried ever since then to, um, to try and improve myself as a human being, add what I can back to society, and uh, be ready and available just to talk to people about the ability and the power of change. It is possible to change. It is possible to come somebody else. Uh, I know some of the people that were involved in my attack have changed for the better. I know some have more or less stayed the same. You can't really expect society to change. It begins with you. It started with the stones setting in the ground Laying all the pathways through our town Started with the rainfall Battering your face it all Started when the gales came Whistling, whistling down My love seems The dust hasn't settled on the city We left alone And the vultures are so Our lungs choking on exhaust, searching for a sign until we lost. Started with the pavements, loveless embrace it all. Started when the gales came to carry us so far.